Good morning. Uh, it's Monday morning, and uh, in a sense, the long wait's over. We, we've made it to episode nine of the story of English. It's called Next Year's Words, and I've been a little apologetic over the last couple of episodes because I wasn't sure I could carry my viewers, but now I find it gets very interesting again as we approach the end. Um, it's going to start, you'll see Jamaica's dub poets right at the lead, lead up. Uh, he'll come back to them uh, uh, later. Um, and he mentions, uh, will we see the end of English like Latin? You know, that's such a shocker, the end of English. English is worldwide. <laughs> it's the world's second language. Uh, everyone's second, not well, not, but how could we see the end of it? Well, he'll explain. He'll explain Latin was the language of Europe, and it's gone. Well, it's, it's not gone. Um, as, as a spoken language, it's basically gone. Anyway, we'll come back to that. He's going to talk about pigeons and creoles uh, and patois, patois. Let me explain this. I looked this up. A patois is not so much a linguistic term. It's a, it's a, it's a manner of speaking which is regarded as not okay. I mean, not socially high. A pidgin is a contact language, uh, a, a mixture of two languages used in order to uh, communicate. And then a creole is, as he explains later, is when a, when a pidgin becomes uh, a children's first language, a first language, that's not their second language, but their first language, that pidgin, well then it becomes a creole. So these are linguistic terms, and uh, I'm finally I'm finally more ready uh, to explain explain them. Uh, the Empire Striking Back. Now that's a play on words. Uh, the Empire Strikes Back, of course, was uh, one. Of, I think it was the second Star Wars movie, maybe. Well, the British Empire <coughs> striking back uh, against English in in that it's may disperse English is is his uh, greater suggestion in the whole <coughs> uh, episode. You'll hear about ship's jargon and maritime English, uh, two ways to refer to that sort of the universal speech on, on uh, British, well, merchant marine ships, but British at that time. Then he's going to jump <coughs> to uh, Mel Melanesia. I think I spelled it right. Melanesia and Papua New Guinea. Here I find it so interesting. Now there's some nudity, once again, not a lot, but there's some nudity, so be warned if you're, say, in a public school. <coughs> Um, and uh, he'll use the term contact language uh, for pigeon. That's what uh, the man, I can't think what his name is now, uh, that's what he's using. He's using a pigeon as a contact language. Uh, and uh, in, in, in New Guinea, he, he said there's somewhere around 750 languages. At the beginning of um, the Frank School, in the first year, <coughs> I, I pose the question as I'm teaching linguistics, which is something you might want to go back and look at. I, I have it as a playlist now. Uh, how many languages do you think there are in the world? <laughs> you know, and I'll, I'll sometimes I'll trick them by saying, well, you know, there's English and German and French and Spanish and, and Portuguese and Chinese and yet how many do you think? And the kids will guess all over the place. Well, the answer is around 5,000, four to 5,000 known human languages. Now, some of them are gone. And, you know, that's sort of staggering in a way. But in New Guinea alone, there's about that many, just New Guinea. And, and the American West, uh, the American Indian languages, so many, so many in Africa. All right, uh, <clears throat> I've got women versus men because as, as the man's going up into the mountains, uh, walking there with his stick, uh, they go by a woman in a, 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 a cottage and, she, and they say she doesn't speak any pigeon, so he, he can't speak with her. Well, I've noticed this. And I'm not sure if it was actually directly taught to me when I was studying linguistics at Harvard, but it's, I think it's, I'm not the first one that came up with this idea, that men historically have gone out more into other communities, and women have tended to stay more at home. Uh, see, this was not the kind of thing you wanted to be saying back in the 1960s and 1970s when I was at Harvard. Uh, with women's liberation, but historically speaking, women have tended to stay more at home. Uh, and so they have been less likely to, say, learn uh, pidgin uh, English. 
Uh, I also have gone on to suggest, and this might have been my idea, I'm not sure if this was taught to me, that women are the carriers of the native language, more importantly than men. In the, in the babies, little babies, I think, learn their language more from their mothers and the women around them than the men. Now, I'm going out on a limb here, I think, because I'm not ready to, to back this up with other authorities. But I, I think there is that distinction, I think. Well, anyway, now uh, the, uh, the, the visual becomes so interesting, I think, partly because it's so exotic. I mean, Ireland is lovely, but it's not as exotic as what you're going to see here. Uh, I'm a little reminded, every time I see that, I'm a little reminded of my Peace Corps experience in Brazil. But uh, you should not imagine me like that. I lived in a town, and I worked with uh, craftsmen with hand workers. Uh, uh, I, I did go into the bush, you might call it. I did go up into the mountains uh, some, sometimes as excursions, but that was not my daily work li like that man's was. And he's British. Um, there was something else I was going to say. Oh, I know. I have used this in school. I was careful with the nudity. But I've used this in school because with the seventh and eighth graders that I was teaching, it's just so interesting to see. I knew that even if they didn't understand the uh, linguistic theory, uh, they would be, their world would be expanded by having seen uh, what they see in Papua New Guinea. Then, <clears throat> then he's going to shift to West Africa, Sierra Leone, and it's pre-town. Now this uh, English, it was an English colony. Uh, uh, again, I'm reminded of my past. I lived for about two months in, in West Africa, in Senegal, but that was a French colony, uh, so it was, a, it was a different experience. Al although I do remember that my French didn't improve all that much that summer. And when I got, after it was over, when I came back and I went through France, boy, <laughs> I had found the African French a good bit easier to speak and to understand than the, uh, certainly the Parisian French. Uh, uh, talky talky is the way I would spell uh, uh, the term he uses for, I guess, pigeon. I guess it's the pigeon in, in West Africa. Uh, he, he breaks down black English into four kinds that are developing. Remember, this was 1986, and I'm sure developments have gone on, but there's British black English, Caribbean Black English, or Caribbean Creole, he calls it. And this I also have a memory. When I was just a boy, I worked as a busboy uh, carrying dishes in a hotel. And there was a band there from, I think, I think they were from Jamaica, I'm not sure, that played the steel drums. I can still hear them playing Yellow Bird all the time. Uh, and uh, when they spoke among themselves, <coughs> I couldn't understand it. That was my first experience with Caribbean Creole. And I was trying to think if I, at that time, tried to learn a little bit of it. I'm not so sure. They, they pretty much stayed among themselves, the five or six of them. Um, Southern Black English, that would be the American South, I think is what he means, and African English. And then finally, I just write Bristol down to spell it. As he, He's now moving rapidly around the world, and Bristol in England, I, I do not know it, but but these are things that you could use as a springboard in a classroom or with your homeschooled child to look at, well, where are these places? Well, we only have about two days left, and then uh, the story of English, uh, as Robert McNeil presents it, uh, will be over. See you tomorrow.